Welcome to the Reading Without Walls podcast. I'm Gene Yang. I'm the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, and I am here today with Michael Shabon. That's it. You That's it. something that uh, my friends and I argue about all the time. There's some, even in my <laughs> own family, there is not agreement about the proper pronunciation. So I'm, okay. I'm very flexible. I'll <laughs> go with anything. That's great. Well, Michael, you are one of the most celebrated writers in America today. You won the, the big kahuna, you won uh, the Pulitzer Prize mm-hmm. with a, uh, a book named Tablet and Clay, which is for adults. Like, personally, it meant a lot to me. As, as a comic book fan, it was, it was huge for me. Thank you. Thank so, you. I, I've been an admirer of yours for years. Uh, and you only, you, you don't only write for, for adults, you also write for kids. Right, yeah, I've done, I, I, uh, I did a picture book with Jake Parker, the great illustrator. Uh, Missile Mouse and many other things um, uh, called The o- Astonishing Secret of Awesome Man. And then I've written a novel for middle readers called Summerland, okay. uh, which is uh, just a, a reissued with a new cover and a new introduction by me looking back at sort of the, how I came to write that book in the first place. And I'm going to be starting work on a new book for, for middle readers, uh, young readers. Um, pretty soon this summer, I think. Very cool. Well, tell me a little bit more about Summerland. Summerland uh, was my attempt at writing a kind of book that I loved to read when I was young, uh, an epic fantasy uh, novel. So, you know, I was really into um, uh, Lloyd Alexander's oh Chronicles of Prydain. Yeah. Uh, the you know the Black Cauldron, the Book yeah. of Three, all the way through the High King. Um, that series just meant so much to me. Uh, Susan Cooper's The Dark Is Rising sequence, um, and then you know the Narnia books, and then when I got a little older, Tolkien, uh, you know that kind of fantasy on an epic scale, uh, typically about kind of a humble character, um, you know who doesn't seem at first glance like like. They're going to be a hero uh, in, with a mythological, strongly mythological kind of backdrop. Um, you know, in the case of the Prydain books, the Lloyd Alexander, it was rooted in Welsh mythology. Yeah. And uh, 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 the, well, the Narnia books are very Christian uh, allegory, uh, rooted in kind of Christian mythology, if you will. And then Susan Cooper was Celtic mythology, and Tolkien used a lot of Northern European kind of uh, mythological material. So... You know, that's what I was into as a kid, and, I, and I, I had this idea actually originally when I was a kid, which was, I was really into fairies and fairy lore and, like, little people's stories of, you know, um, and I used to wonder, you know, were there fairies, were there fairies in America, were there, or were there fairy stories in America, and, you know, I did discover, like, Native people did have stories that were very similar in many ways to, um, to the fairy stories from Europe, and then of course Europeans brought over uh, a lot of the same stories, so that you would find in like Appalachian folk tales that bore strong resemblance to like Scottish tales uh-huh. about people being kidnapped by fairies. Um, and so I always had this thought, of, like maybe I could do some kind of epic fantasy with like an American mythology that would be behind um, behind it. But that, you know, I was. 10, 11 years old, I never got that far with it. And then when I started thinking about writing a, this book as an adult for young readers, I came back to that idea. And I, I'm, I'm, I, I was, at the time especially, that I wrote the book, I was a huge baseball fan. I love baseball. Okay. And baseball is this very mythic kind of sport. And so I started to think, I had been looking for a, kid, a book to read to my kids about baseball that was like a, a, a novel about baseball that would be good. And I was having a really hard time uh, finding like sports books, sports fiction typically has yeah. not been the greatest. Yeah. Um, there are exceptions and books, fiction about baseball. There's great fiction about baseball for adults, but there just wasn't that much for, for younger readers. Yeah. Um, other than the kind of typical like, oh, I know good. I wish I could hit better. And then I yeah. don't know how to hit. And that's the end of the story. Kind of it's, yeah. it didn't have a lot of resonance. Um, yeah. So I am. Um, I thought, okay, I'm going to use baseball as like my mythology, and I'll do sort of American mythology sort of more broadly. And I kind of ended up sort of understanding American mythology as being composed of bits and pieces of mythology from all the various, both the, the native people who are here and then the various uh, immigrant groups, whether they were 
um, European immigrants or African Americans or Asian Americans. Um, the, all these mythologies sort of blended together in the backdrop of Summerland to kind yeah. of create this sort of supposedly kind of American mythology with little people and and um, uh, you know that was how I tried to so solve this the is problem. something that you've been thinking about since you were a kid. Yeah, that, yes, I had since you were ten years old. Yeah, wow, yeah, it was like floating around in my mind all wow. that time. And and can I ask how old you were when it finally came out? Uh, um, I was uh, forty. Wow, so 30, 30 years. You hung on to the story for 30 years. Yeah, yeah. And then it came out. Uh, it, you know, it just, the opportunity just sort of had never quite been there. And it, I think it was more, more, more than anything, it was the experience of reading to my kids. Yeah. Uh, as I started to have children and would read them first, you know, graduating from picture books to, to um, chapter books and rediscovering, rereading the per day books to my kids, rereading yeah. uh, the Susan Cooper books to my kids and this re-encountering these books that were still really powerful experiences for me to read them and I just, you know, like that for me the desire to write has always been, has always followed on reading something yeah. and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, when I re-encountered the Susan Cooper books, when I re-encountered the Narnia books, which hadn't really quite been my favorites as a kid. I read them sort of dutifully more than like with pleasure, but as a, an adult reading those sentences, he wrote beautiful sentences <laughs> and, I, and I thought, you know, you can write a book for younger readers, you can write a book for middle readers and still write beautiful sentences like yeah. these and have it work. That, then that became sort of the artistic way in for me. Like the creative yeah. way in was there from the time was I was 10 years old. But yeah. the, how am I gonna make this something I want to do now as a 39-year-old man. And when I read those sentences in Susan Cooper's work too, these, like, these very lovely, um, plain, but <clears throat> rich with imagery sentences, um, you know, that's where I thought, yeah, I could, that's how I'm going to approach this. Wow. Okay, so that just goes to show, if you have an idea, just don't give up on it. Yeah, Sooner I think so. Later, you may come out don't throw way. anything away, yeah. right? Don't, yeah. throw, don't throw anything away. You never know... Um, uh, what's gonna what when the opportunity might arise and mm -hmm. you'll need it. You know, I, I carry a bag with me everywhere I go, a purse if you will. Uh -huh. And um, you know, uh, I put a lot of things in that purse. And over the years that I've been carrying it, I've learned like, well, no, I'm gonna actually keep this sunscreen in my purse because you never know when someone's gonna yeah. need sunscreen. Or I'm gonna keep this. I have a first aid kit with band aids and blister band aids, and you know, over time. Like it's heavy, this purse. And it has a lot of things in it, but but you know, you just never know, right? You and if you if you have the thing you need at the time you need it, um, then uh, I mean that's what it's all about, and that's what it's all about with writing in general for me. Like if you to have what you need when that moment arises is the, is is that's what it's all about. So that you know, like um. Louis Pasteur said, chance favors the prepared mind. Like, uh, if you're ready because you've done the reading, you've done the research, or you've made the time in your schedule, or you've created a routine where you get writing done, or, or, or you've just been listening and paying attention when people were talking about certain things, and then this moment arises where, where the, the inspiration strikes, or you get the idea, or you get the commission, or whatever it is, you're ready to go because you've been prepared. And um, so, I mean, I think... That's why you should never give up on things. Never yeah. throw anything away because you just you never know. You never know. Mm -hmm. Ideas are like sunscreen. Exactly. And your brain is like a purse. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I I heard you advise people to to read books that they may not be initially drawn to. Things right. That don't necessarily right. attract you. And that's actually something that um that we're talking about. The Library of Congress is talking about for these two years. We we want to get people to read outside their walls. Yeah. I mean it's. It's great that you read, and it's very important that you read, and that, and, and that, and to be sparked to write usually is a result of an encounter with a book that you love, like something that you like. I love epic fantasy, or I love novels about you know realistic fiction about teenagers struggling with the kind of issues. Like that's the stuff I like to read. That's the kind of stuff I want to write. That's fine, uh -huh. but. When it comes, if you actually want to, well, for many reasons. I mean, one, you should always be, I think you should always be challenging yourself in every way. As Just as a person for your own good, you should be challenging yourself to step outside of the 
of the walls of, uh-huh. the, of the prison that we all kind of keep ourselves in without even noticing. Mm-hmm. First of all, your own skull is a prison. Like you're trapped uh-huh. in here. You can never know what is what it what it what it's like to be somebody else. You can only imagine. Well, how are you going to imagine what it's like to be somebody else? What are the tools? You know, fiction, literature is probably, I think, the greatest tool that has ever been invented to try to help people understand what it's like to be somebody else, what it would be like to be somebody else. And um, the, the way to sort of, I think the more of those experiences you have, the, the more easily you are able to imagine what it might be like to be somebody else, well, the less likely you are to try to do another person harm, <laughs> the less likely you are to try to persecute another person, be prejudiced against them, um, uh, or constrain their freedom or their liberty in any way. So, I mean, I, I do think it actually, like a moral imagination is what makes people uh, more able to live in harmony and, mm-hmm. and relative peace with each other, mm-hmm. because they are able to imagine the golden rule. That's what it's all yeah. about, right? Yeah. Do not do unto others what is hateful to you, or do unto others what you would have yeah. others do unto you. Well, that, that's asking you, just try to imagine what it's like to be the other person. Yeah. And then you would do that, what fiction does. and that's what literature, that's what fiction does for us. So, I mean, but if you stick in your little zone where you're, it's just like sticking. You were talking earlier about sort of um, uh, uh, the disadvantages of limiting your social circle, your 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 experience of humans to sort of people who are like you, mm-hmm. and that it, you're cheating yourself, yeah. you're denying yourself of the potential pleasures of. Um, other cultures, other cuisines, other literatures, other yeah. other ways of looking at the world, um, and you know I think you 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 with reading it works the same way. You you have to challenge yourself sometimes. This is always fine to come back to the stuff mm-hmm. you know you're gonna love, but you want to challenge yourself. And a lot of times when you step outside and you say you're like I hate science fiction, say you're one of those people, right? You say you hate science fiction. You never, you never know. You know, yeah. you, there, there, there are works that you step outside that zone and you try something that someone's maybe recommended to you. It's that Ursula K. Le Guin novel. Uh, it's you know, uh, The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin. You don't like science fiction. You sit down. You start reading that book. You discover the sentences are incredibly beautifully crafted. The mm-hmm. world that she conjures is vivid and real. The characters feel like real people. Uh, even though one of them comes from this race of humans where they can change gender back and forth kind of at will, and men can become women and have babies and then go back to being men again, um, she makes that all so plausible that you, you're just completely immersed in the world and then you have this experience that has ena- enabled you to um, widen the scope of your, it's going to push back your prison walls just like a little bit further. I think that's only a good thing. Well, are there any books that you would recommend that um, do that? Uh, uh, for younger readers, I mean, I think, well, Ursula K. Le Guin, I forgot to mention her, her series is the Earthsea Trilogy, um, those are fantastic novels, and if you liked Harry Potter, um, if you've read Harry Potter and you've enjoyed it, um, to, if you want to see a, a very different take on the idea of a school for wizards and a wizard's education, um, Ursula K. Le Guin, in a sense, got there first uh, in a very different way. And her books, unlike the J.K. Rowling's, are set on a different world, a world that's very different than our world, um, uh, a world where it's basically one vast ocean and there's and it's just covered in islands. And everyone, all these people live on these various islands. And um, it's about this quest of this young wizard who discovers his magical ability and is sort of sent to this academy for the training of wizards and it's about his own journey into finally becoming a man and then finally at the end of the ser- series kind of an, an old man who is in turn a teacher mm-hmm. for wizards. so I mean that those are wonderful books um, and then I re- read them and reread them as a kid um, you know I love books uh, about uh, mice <laughs> I love books about uh-huh. intelligent mice when I was a kid you know m- mouse society uh-huh. Uh-huh. mouse worlds um, so the uh, secret of Nim. Yeah, that favorite. book uh, yeah. is such a great that was one book. Of my Mrs. Too. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim yeah. uh, is you know such a wonderful book, um, and I loved um, the Miss Bianca books. And uh, and then Ralph, the Ralph, uh, the Runaway Ralph, Ralph motorcycle. goes in the motorcycle, yeah. Beverly Cleary. Yeah. Yep. I mean those things. I mean basically, if there were mice on the cover. 
you know, yeah. I, I would give it a try. The okay. Basil of Basil Street. There were a lot. Yeah, the mouse, it's a genre. Sherlock Holmes's uh -huh. like, floorboards and, and uh, Stuart Little. Stuart Little. Yeah. I mean, he's actually a boy who has the mouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Happens to be a mouse. It's kind yes. of strange. That's a weird book. Actually. But that's almost this, like a genre. Mm -hmm. itself. Oh yeah, it the, is. The mouse I'm genre. not sure how, where, how, and where it's alive today, or who's really like doing the there's interesting a, work with mice comic. today. Yes, a lot oh, of mice. Yeah, there, there's a one called Mouse Scar. Yeah, oh, that's huge. Yeah, that's so wonderful. beautiful. That's a, that's an amazing piece of work. Yeah. I wish you would finish it. Now you mentioned uh, you mentioned sports books. Are mm -hmm. there any? Do you have any favorite sports books? I mean fiction. You know, when I was a kid, I, I mostly read nonfiction about sports, okay. like biographies of athletes, uh -huh. baseball players, whoever that I, I was interested in. There's there's a YA book called uh, Ball Don't Lie mm. by a guy named Matt Delapena, mm. who recently won the Newberry. He's kind oh, wow. of a big deal wow. now, I have not but he it. was also a, a basketball player in college, uh -huh. so it's all about... Oh, that's cool. About basketball. I mean, basketball's ripe, I think, and has yeah, not really yeah. been, even in adult fiction either, though. It's, it's underserved right now. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so fun, much for, for joining me. It was, uh, it was great, great to talk to you. Great to hang out with you today. For me too. Thank you. Uh -huh.